Hi everybody and welcome to Christian Life Church Online. We are so glad you've joined with us again. And uh, if it's your first time, welcome here. We are really glad you've joined us. We are doing a new series called God in My Everything. We've just finished going through the entire Bible. We have preached from every book over the last year and a half or so. And so we're really excited about this new series. Really is, uh, we talk about um, our time, our talent, our treasure. Today I wanna to talk to you about serving and where are we at with our serving to uh, other people, our serving of God or to God. And I was doing a, an internet search the other day of some popular preachers and looking at some bios. And here's some of the stuff that, that they've been saying about themselves. And also uh, there's one part in here about somebody who had a failure in what they wrote about them. But let's talk first of all about what one preacher says about himself in his bio. Um, I'm gonna just name up, make up some names, so I'll just call this guy John. John is a pastor, a songwriter, a New York Times best-selling author, as founder and lead pastor. He's helped grow the multi-site generic church into a global ministry through online streaming, television, and the music of generic church worship. He holds a Master of Divinity degree from Christian Theological Seminary, another made-up name, and is the author of several popular books. So that's what this particular preacher has to say about himself and the promotion of himself. Then there's another uh, gentleman who had a, a, a fail, failure, a moral failure, and here's what was written about him. It says, but sexual infidelity was only one piece of the story that led to Pastor, I'm gonna call him Fred, Pastor Fred's dismissal. There is clear evidence pointing to general narcissistic behavior, manipulating, mistreating people, as well as breaches of trust connected to lying and constantly lying. So that is in stark contrast really to, I think what Jesus would have to say about himself and how Jesus would, would live and, and, uh, and do ministry. Here's another one, I'm gonna call this guy Doug. Pastor Doug is one of the world's most revered masterminds. He leverages his pioneering vision and instinct to serve others in areas extending beyond the church. He is recognized as America's best preacher by Time Magazine as well as one of the nation's most influential and mesmerizing preachers by New York Times. He is a charismatic yet humble man. And these are some of the things that have been written, that have been put in as bios, and I'm, I'm sharing all of this stuff because I think it's true that all of us would like to be re recognized for something good. It's, you know, it's nice to get an email from somebody that says, hey, you did really well at some, something or such and such a thing, and I really appreciate what you did. Or, or for your boss to say, you just did an amazing job, or a teacher to say, that was an amazing paper, you did really great. Because life is full of hard work. We find ourselves accumulating, achieving, trying to get ahead, acquiring stuff, looking after stuff, managing stuff, managing our life, managing our work, managing our schedules, and everything we have to do. And so it's nice to get some words of affirmation. Now, it's very interesting, though, that the words spoken about these preachers, both good and bad, both flattering and, and factual, whatever, is, is it, it's just, I find it interesting because ultimately anybody who's called to preach the gospel is called to rightly divide the word, to preach and to teach Jesus, to promote Jesus. Now let me stop there for a second. To promote Jesus. To talk about Jesus. To put him on the pedestal. To glorify him. To lift him up. Now this is the same Jesus who spoke of himself in these terms. In Matthew 20, 28. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now imagine putting that in your bio. Pastor George has uh, come to serve people and ultimately he's looking forward to being a martyr for Christ. That would be what Pastor George's uh, bio would say if he was to emulate what Christ had to say about himself. Now, did Christ not cast out demons, raise the dead, heal the sick, turn water into wine and feed thousands miraculously? Did he not preach to thousands of people? Did he not turn the world upside down? Was he not the one who from birth struck fear into the hearts of those who led empires? Was he not the son of God? That's a pretty decent bio. And yet he said that he came not to be served, but to serve. His primary mission was to give glory to his Father in heaven and to exalt him. And he should be our example. You see, Christian discipleship that runs counter to culture, that radically goes against the norms of society, that slaps in the face our carnal desire to be somebody, to be recognized as somebody, to be great, is what real discipleship is about. That we too would come to serve. So as we talk about God in my everything, we're talking about stewardship. Stewardship of our talents, our time, our treasure. We're going to be doing that for the next, uh, including today, the next four weeks. And so today as I talk about serving, we ask the question, are, are we serving? Who are we serving? Where are we serving? If we're not, it may point to uh, an area of our lives that we need to look at. An area of our lives that would take some time, some sacrifice, some effort, so that we don't miss this important component of what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to be asking some questions and maybe giving a couple of thoughts about serving here. And the first question is this. Is serving only for those with a gift of serving? Now, this question would be based on people's understanding of Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. And it talks about various ministry gifts that people have. And here's what it says. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So here's where the confusion comes. You have all these different ministry gifts listed here. One of them happens to be serving. And so it would be easy to assume from this, when we get to discover what our gifts are, when we get to know what they are, to say, well, I have a gift of serving, therefore I should serve. But the person who has a gift of giving or a gift of leadership or administration may also say, well, I have this particular gift, so I'm going to give generously, or I have this gift, so I'm going to lead diligently. Because there are people who are gifted at different things, and they love exercising their gifts, and they excel at them. That's their ministry. It's what they do. It's their life's mission. But no matter what your gift is, may I suggest that it should be used to serve others, to serve God, and to expand God's kingdom. So we can serve by administration. We can serve by teaching. We can serve by encouraging. We can serve by giving. And we can just simply serve. Now, Jesus clarifies the issue. Uh, before the pronouncement that he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve, there was something going on in the background. You see, his disciples 
were jockeying for position and for prominence. And um, they wanted to, you know, kind of be number one and two in his kingdom. And it says in Matthew 20, verse 25 to 27, that Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercised authority over them, not so with you. Guys, we don't do that kind of stuff. We don't lord it over people. We don't act like we're better. We don't walk around with our noses in the air. We're not out there trying to get people to do things for us. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. He clarifies here that all of us, all of them, are called, first of all, to serve. Which brings us to the next question. Where can I serve? Well, I think a good place to start is, is in your church. See, if you're attending a church, I believe that every one of us should have a ministry. Every one of us should have something that we do. We've made this, this shift over the last 20 years where churches are doing more and more of hiring people rather than people, you know, volunteering. People don't serve the way they used to. And if you look at it, it's not working very good. Going back a number of years ago, we had this thing called Sunday school. A Sunday school would typically take sometimes dozens of people to keep it running. I remember being in a church and sitting in a little classroom and we always had one teacher and there might be five or ten kids sitting there and he would every week open the Bible and teach us a lesson. And so then when I went off to college to get trained for the ministry, I had a pretty good understanding of the Old Testament, the New Testament, the stories in the Old Testament about Jesus. I had a really good understanding of that. In speaking to uh, our college professors today, what they're finding is students that are going into college to train for ministry, many of them are biblically illiterate. And they're literally having to start from square one with some of them. Now you think about that. You go from really having no knowledge, no understanding of the scriptures to within three to four to maybe five years, they've got to stand up and preach and teach the word of God. Well, why is that? It goes back to the local church and it goes back to the individual when people say, I'm just done or I don't have time, I'm not going to make this investment. And, and we can literally raise young people in the church who have no biblical knowledge and understanding. They're not getting enough just through a 20-minute sermon every Sunday. And so I believe that, that that's just one example. In the church, every one of us should have a ministry, something that we do regularly, consistently, and faithfully. Why is that? Well, because the church is, is promoting and building the work of the kingdom of God. That's the most important work in the world. I don't care if you're building a corporation. I don't care if you're building a great uh, institution. I don't care if you're running a government of a country. The church, the work of the kingdom of God, is the most important work in the world. Why is that? It's because it's eternal. It has eternal dividends. It actually affects people for all of eternity. Not just the 50, 60, 70, 80 years that we're on this earth, but forever and ever and ever. In our own church, we have this, uh, this board that uh, lists the various ministry. Uh, I guess it's an organizational chart. And on this organizational chart, it lists all the different ministries of the church, all the various, various offices whereby we may serve. And in our church, we need people to serve in administration, organization, leadership, music, 
We need teachers, we need kids workers, people that are going to work in our community, bring the church to the community to serve. Why? It's for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. And here's something that I've been thinking about. Sometimes we wait for other people to catch our vision. And I've actually found myself doing this in the last couple of weeks. Complaining about something going on in the city, complaining about something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be done. And wondering why, why isn't the, the mayor doing it? Why isn't the, the city council doing something? Why aren't they addressing this issue? And I felt God kind of rebuke me in my heart the other day. And he said, your burden actually may be your calling. Why are you waiting for others? Why don't you do something about it? You see, your idea, your burden may in fact be God's calling. It may be where he wants you to serve. It may be that he's waiting for you to say yes and not others, but you. So we serve in the workplace. You might look at something at work and wonder, why isn't anybody addressing this? Why isn't anybody doing anything about this? Maybe you're supposed to. We go to work. We work hard. We show up. We're faithful. We're the best employee we can be at all times. In the community, we represent Jesus. We, we build relationships. We serve. In the church, we serve. We're building the kingdom. The third point I want to make today, it's a statement. And it's this, that our service might be somebody else's miracle. Think about that. When we use our skills, our talents, and our abilities to serve, we are literally being the hands and the feet of Jesus. When Jesus fed the multitude, we like to say, well, that was a great miracle. But he was serving. He was serving. He was meeting a very practical need. People were very hungry, and he fed them. When Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, we could say, well, that was a great miracle. Jesus raises the dead back to life. Yeah, but he also gave a brother back to two sisters who really needed him. He gave life and hope back to a family. He served this family. When he cast demons out. Well, here's another one. When he turned water into wine. He was kind of bailing the, 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 the host of this, of this wedding banquet out of a pickle. He was serving the guests when he performed his first miracle. And you see, his serving, his miracles, oftentimes met specific needs and helped people who were in great distress. His simple service was a miracle. And something small and easy for us to do may be a miracle for somebody else. It might be an impossibility for someone else. Think of this. Uh, here's an example. Very simple. I can change a tire. No problem. I know how to do that. But a single mom with two small kids, it has to get to the coffee shop to go to work. If she wakes up and goes out to her little old car and finds the tire flat, she might need a miracle. Who does she call? What does she do? She might not even have a spare. And, and it, it may be within the possibility, the realm of possibility for, for somebody to say, yeah, I can look after that. I'll buy her a tire. No problem. I'll take it down and get it fixed. I can do that. It takes me an hour. And, and for that person, it, it's a small act of service. But for that individual that's receiving the service, it's a miracle. It means that they're able to earn a living that day. It means they're able to put food on the table. It means they're able to pay their rent and look after their children. 
And that's what I'm saying is something small, something easy for us to do may be a miracle. And so I want to encourage you today to think of your service as something fairly significant. That I could actually be performing a miracle for someone. It could be giving somebody a ride. It could be doing their taxes. It could be any number of things. Here's a, a sample of something that was really kind of cool that happened for my wife and I. A couple of years ago, we were going up to see someone in the hospital. It was just an evening. It was a routine visit. Nothing special. We were just going to visit somebody who was sick in the hospital. Now, unbeknownst to us, in the same ward that we were going to be visiting was a young Christian woman who was with her father who was dying along with the rest of the family. They were there too. And I don't know why, but she had just finished praying that God would send to that family, to them in that moment, a Pentecostal pastor to come and pray with them. I didn't know that. As we walked in, walked through the double doors into that ward, she happened to step out into the hallway and we just met there. I'd only met her one or two times before. And she said, are you here to see my dad? And I'm like, no, but what's going on? Long story short, I ended up going into the room with her family and prayed with her dad before he died. We were just doing something ordinary. But for her, it actually turned into a miracle. Your act of service can be somebody else's miracle. Your routine habit of serving may be an opportunity to perform a miracle in somebody else's life just by serving. So I think serving kind of is important. The fourth thing, being like Jesus is serving like Jesus. At the beginning of this message, I was reading some preacher's bios. And in these bios, they listed their accomplishments, their reputations. Unfortunately, one of them had some failures and whatnot. And it's easy for us to get confused by all of this. And here's where the confusion lays. We sometimes put our eyes on other people and we do a little bit of comparing. Say, well, I'm nothing like that individual. I haven't got a worldwide ministry. I'm not a mesmerizing conversationalist. I'm just little old me. Well, let me put it to you this way. Maybe it's time we took our eyes off of some of the people that are popular and well-known and put them where they really need to be, on Jesus Christ. Because he's our true example. It could be said of Jesus that he was all wise, he was all knowing, he was all powerful, he was eternal, he was everywhere. Those are the attributes of God, the same attributes of Jesus. Yet in his ministry, he didn't go around saying, hey, I'm the strongest man in the world. I know everything. I am everywhere. I am the son of God. Well, he did say that as a fact, but not as an, an opportunity to promote himself. Yet in his ministry, what he was trying to get across to people, what his teaching was about, what his example to us was, was among many things, it was about serving. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 29, he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Gentle and humble. As one preacher states, he said, gentleness is strength under control. And that being humble in heart is being lowly. It's being a helper. It's being a servant. It was evident in John 13, 1 to 5, where he didn't act as a leader when he was with his disciples. He didn't act like an entrepreneur. He didn't walk into the room and say, hey, I'm the greatest, look at me. Let's celebrate my presence. He showed his gentleness and his humility. 
He got out a pail of water, threw a towel over his shoulder, and said, guys, let me wash your feet. He served them. He set an example of service. It was an act of humiliation for him, but it was an act of also, it's very humbling to have somebody wash your feet. So as I close today, I remember this little course that once circulated. It said, make me more like you, Jesus. Make me more like you. And I think it's time for us as a church to, to not be looking at superstars, to not be comparing ourselves to the popular, to the powerful, to the influencers. But let's get a fresh look at Jesus Christ, who was humble and gentle in heart, one who came to be served, or not to be, not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. Nothing like messing up an entire message at the very end. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Let's look at that Jesus. There's lots to learn from him. Well, one of the areas that we've been serving is we've been serving uh, people that have been coming from Ukraine. We've got some more families coming in September. I think we're actually going to be flying them in and helping them get established in, in homes and uh, all their household items. And if you're able to help support us in these efforts, we're not a huge church. Uh, you can contact us through our website, clcwinnipeg.ca. Then in October, we have another area that we're going to be serving. And we're going to be supplying thousands of pairs of socks for the homeless in Winnipeg. That is a need in talking to some of the charities that serve the homeless. They say, we just have an endless need of a supply of socks. Every day, people need fresh socks. Their feet get wet, they're out in the cold, and we're going to help by serving that need throughout the month of October. I want to thank you for joining us. And let me, let me just say this in closing. Jesus loves you. Jesus came to serve you by dying on the cross for your sins. And every one of us needs to, at one point or another, come to a, a decision about Christ and what we're going to do with him. Am I going to live for myself or am I going to live for Jesus? Jesus can actually help you feel secure about your future, about your eternity, and about life after death. Jesus came to die for your sins, and Jesus came to give you eternal life. And the fact of the matter is, we can submit our lives to Christ, we can be forgiven, we can ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, we can ask Jesus to be the Lord and the master of our hearts and our lives, and we can commit to being followers of him. And as we do those things, we can have the assurance of heaven and eternal life. And I encourage you, to make that your prayer today. Thank you for joining us. If you want to check us out, we're clcwinnipeg.ca. And we're located at 1042 Jefferson on, uh, in Winnipeg. On June, or June, September the 11th, we're going to be going back to two services, 945 and 1115. You're welcome. Come and check us out. Uh, you'll find our church to be very friendly, very loving and very accepting. And uh, we hope to see you soon. God bless you. Have a great week.